All right, thank you for joining us for this Bible study. You know, God's love towards us cannot be adequately described in words. It is that powerful. And He has displayed it to us in so many different ways. Sometimes those ways are obvious to us, and sometimes we never even notice them. And in this chapter, we're going to see God's love contrasted with that of the hate of the devil and his children. But before we begin, please listen for a brief moment as we share something with you. All right, welcome back. Let's get right to it. Please turn with me, if you would, to the first epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 1, and it reads, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Now, don't overlook that. What does it mean to be a son of God? It means you're royalty. And as Christians, we are royalty. And God expects to use us in his service, in the service of the kingdom. You know, I'm going to finish reading this verse. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Think about this. You know, many times, uh, I should say most often, the world doesn't think that much of Christians. And sometimes we don't even think that much of ourselves, because we know we're sinners. But one day, we are actually going to be rulers in his kingdom and more specifically the overcomers in Revelation chapter 20 are going to be ruling with Christ in his kingdom for the millennial kingdom for that thousand year period and I would even add even unto the eternity and you know as Christians it is our duty to be a light unto the world to spread the truth and not only that, not only that, as we're going to see from this chapter, or the next couple of chapters in this uh, epistle of John, that we're supposed to set the example as well. We're not supposed to be just hearers. We're not supposed to just gain knowledge. We're supposed to put that knowledge into action. And uh, in a way that people would know that a Christian has just been in their midst someone who follows Christ to the best of their ability, someone who tries to mimic his love, his kindness, his gentleness, as well as um, his, uh, his service to the king. Because there has been no greater example of a servant than that of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For he was the perfect servant. So, so what he's saying here is God loves us so much that he is going to call us his sons. And again, I'm going to stress again, that's not a light title. That's a title of royalty. And, um, well, we'll continue on. Beloved, you are the sons of God, or the children of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him, as he is 
You know, what he's, what I think what John is trying to say here is that when we get into that spiritual body, we are going to look like him because he is in a spiritual body as well. And we don't even, we can't even grasp the fullness of what it's going to be like in that body. Um, because we're in the flesh now. And the flesh has so many different things. It's, it's corruptible. It can become sick. It can become ill. And you name it, this, this flesh age is just a, just a blink of the eye as far as when you look at the spectrum or the timeline of God's plan and the eternity. So you can think of this, this little age that we're here, this little time we're here in the flesh as just a testing ground. It's a testing period and we're going to go back to our normal state of being as a son of God in that incorruptible body. And how fascinating it's going to be. But you know what? It says we're going to see him there. You know, I long for that day. And I know many of you do as well. Where you can see him face to face. And have him wrap his arms around you. And tell you, a job well done, my good and faithful servant. You know, that's really, uh, I just, I'll use myself in, as an example here. That's really the driving force that drives me to study his word and to teach it and to try to serve him to the best of my ability because I want, I want to make him happy. I want him to be happy when he sees me. You know, you, you think of children today and their parents, you know, they don't want to let their parents down. They don't want to disappoint them. Um, you know, I'm speaking of a good child. They, they want to make their parents happy and uh, they will do anything um, to make them happy. You know, of course, they're going to mess up. They're going to screw up. But that, but that's, that's the ultimate goal. And what I'm trying to say is that should be our ultimate goal as well, is to make our Father happy. Uh, because no greater sadness, I think no greater sadness can a person have than that they get to heaven and they have to face our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, and have him look at them with a countenance of disappointment. You know, that, that's, a, that's something we want to avoid. And that's why, we, that's why we study His Word and try to put it into action the best that we can. Because you know what? When you look at your, when you, when you look at your kids today, if they're trying the best they can and they're, they're, they're messing up, they're falling down, it, you know, it's, it's, in a way, it's kind, of, it's kind of cute. You love them because they're trying the best that they can to do what is right. Do you think our Heavenly Father isn't the same way? When He sees someone doing the best they can, even if they stumble. And, you know, I always, I, I can think of Moses um, as an example. Because many of you could be listening right now thinking, well, you know, I'm not that great of a servant. Uh, I have a hard time planting seeds. I have a hard time explaining things to other people. But think of Moses. When God chose him, he chose him because of his heart. Not because he was a polished speaker. Not because he, you know, he was talented in that, but because he had a servant's heart. He loved the people and he loved God. You know, even at one place, uh, Moses said to God, Hey, why are you choosing me? I can't, I don't even know how to speak right. I'm not an eloquent orator. But God said, but God reassured him that he was his servant. Well, I guess he said he would, uh, if he would use Moses or his brother Aaron as the mouthpiece if he had to. But uh, anyways, another topic for another time. I guess the thing is, is how amazing it's going to be. And, I, and, um, and this is the point that John wants to get across to us. That is going to be so fascinating when we get to that eternal kingdom. And when we get to see our Maker and our Lord face to face. Verse 3, Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. And it's going to kind of explain it here in a little bit. But, you know, we're talking about true hope here. A true hope and a true change coming. Not by some nitwit pansy. I think you know who I'm talking about. 
because that's all he amounts to. Someone who is destroying our nation and putting our people into the chains of bondage. That's a false change. And I have to contrast that because, because you have this hope and change used by the false apostles of Satan in this generation trying to spread communism and socialism. But he is our true hope. And that's what makes us pure is thinking about him and thinking about the price that he paid for us as it's going to explain here. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Now check this out. For We're going to be given a definition of what sin is. For sin is the transgression of the law. The, what, what do you mean the law? God's commandments. All the way from the beginning, all the way into the end. The whole book, the Old and New Testament. You know, it just, uh, it just frustrates me when I see uh, certain sects of Christians today say, Oh, we don't have to follow the Old Testament. We don't follow the law anymore. Because they show their ignorance. Because we are, because what is sin? If we didn't follow the law anymore, there would be no sinners. Because sin is the transgression of the law. And if someone is saying we don't follow the law anymore, then in essence they're saying that we don't need Christ. Because when we do transgress that law, he pays the price for us, or he paid the price for us with his blood when we believe, repent, and accept him. Um, as it's going to say here in verse 5, And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. That was his purpose. That was his mission. He came to pay the price for us. And in him is no sin. You know, he was the perfect Lamb of God. And you'll find that in John chapter 1, verse 29, where, um, I believe it's that, where it says, uh, Behold the Lamb of God. If I'm wrong, you can check it out in another place in John where where Christ is described as the Lamb of God. But I must mention this in passing, is that uh, Christ is never described as being our Easter Bunny. Why is that? Because we've, we've talked about it before, but the word Easter is the name, it comes from the name of a heathen sex goddess, Ishtar, which stems back and is and comes from the god the sex goddess Astarte. And all the eggs and all that stuff that were all part of a sexual uh, uh, ritual, fertility rituals practiced by the heathen. So and I think I believe it's twenty-eight times in the book of Revelation, Christ is is uh, described as the Lamb of God. Because he was perfect and he paid the price for our sins. Not, not Easter, Ishtar, Astarte. You know, calling the highest day of Christianity, naming it after the name of a sex goddess, is, is basically, basically like slapping God in the face. It's that serious. And you get people that'll, that'll talk their way around, oh yeah, but you know, we still do, we, do, we still... Uh, celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But, but why do they call it Easter? It doesn't make any sense. In a high-tech information age, we still have Christians today wallowing in ignorance. And it's sad. It really is. But anyways, um, being that Christ was that perfect uh, Lamb of God, we had to throw that in there. Verse 6 Whoso abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So, you know, a lot of people read this and say, well, you know, I'm not a sinner. I don't sin because I believe in Christ. That's not what this is saying. What this is saying is, whosoever abideth in, in Christ, they, they, they're not a, a habitual sinner. And they don't, they don't just sin continually without repenting. Um, that's all it's saying. Of course, you know, there's another place, I think it was in the first chapter of this book, 
It said that whosoever saith that he doesn't sin is a liar. Because there are a lot of hypocrites out there today that think that just because they're a Christian, they're no longer a sinner. And, uh, and we are. You know, I, I thought about something kind of interesting about this verse. Um, that word abideth means, uh, it means to mean or to dwell with. Whosoever abideth in him, what does that mean? To take him into your, take him into your, your soul, into your mind, into your heart. Um, and that, that's what keeps you from being a habitual sinner. I, I, th I think of this, you know, the more time you spend trying to be close to God, the less time you have to sin anyways. And the less tempting it becomes. And does that mean we're going to be perfect? Absolutely not. But you just have less time to be able to do those things when you're trying to do what's right. And uh, verse 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. And what does the word doeth mean? It means to work. You know, we have a lot of lazy Christians in this generation today that say, all I have to do is believe, be saved, and I'm, and I'm going to be raptured out of here. You know, it's laziness. It, to me, that almost sounds like a socialistic, communistic uh, kingdom of heaven. God expects us to work. And it, I believe it's, uh, well, it's somewhere in Revelation uh, 20, 21 or 22. I think it's 22. Where it says that we're going to be paid, rewarded according to our work. It didn't say everybody's going to be paid the same. It's not a socialist heavenly kingdom. It is a kingdom based upon merit and good works. Does that mean we get to heaven based on our works? Absolutely not. We get there because of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But we get paid according to our work. And uh, that's a lesson I think that people need to learn in this generation. You know, because you had over half of the people in this nation vote for someone who is promising them an easy way. A way that doesn't reward hard work, diligence, creativity, exercising the talents and the abilities that God has given us. Because that's, you know, well, anyways, um, the word work there, doeth righteousness, to do the right things. You know, good works can come in many different ways. It can be standing up for the truth, planting seeds, um, doing what is right to your neighbor, setting the example, and on and on the list goes. Those are all good works of righteousness. And again, not everybody's got the same, not everybody has the same gifts, same talents, same capabilities. So you can't compare yourself to other people. You have to do that which was given unto you specifically. And sometimes we work hard trying to figure out exactly what that is. Um, but a lot of times, a lot of people, a lot of people know, kind of know deep down inside what those gifts are. Anyways, verse 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. You know, I think this even is going to, uh, well, he's going to take this even a little bit deeper. But there are a group of people on this earth today that are habitual sinners, that could care less about anybody other than themselves and their pride, their arrogance, their ego. And I'm speaking of primarily the sons of Cain or the Kenites, which, were, which are none other than the children of the devil. So a way, starting way back in the beginning, in the Garden of Eden, of course, uh, with Cain. That's another topic for another time, but those of you who are wise enough and those of you who understand what really happened there in the Garden of Eden, you'll know what I'm talking about. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's what he came here for. And you know what? If you're a servant of his, 
That's what you came here for as well, to defeat the enemy, to conquer the beast as it is written in Revelation chapter 15, not to run from it, not to hide, not to be lazy and sit around while the world's falling apart, but to stand against it and to fight Satan and his lies. That's our mission. That's our purpose. And you know what? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it describes this whole purpose, the purpose of Christ and his servants. It's, in fact, it's the first prophecy of the entire Bible. And it tells us that there would be a war between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed all the way up until the end of time until Christ returns and his foot crushes the head of the serpent. And you know what? As you will notice, uh, that is actually our symbol for Christian Overcomers Ministry because that symbol of Christ's heel crushing the head of the serpent tells it all. It tells our whole mission, our whole purpose is to defeat the evil one. And that's what an overcomer is. That's, that's what Christians were sent here for. We weren't sent here to be goody-goodies, waiting for the first, uh, the first uh, secret rapture uh, uh, bus to leave. We were sent here to make a difference. Is it, is it going to be hard at times? Of course it is. War is never easy. Even training for the war isn't easy. It takes hard work. It takes discipline. It takes motivation. It takes zeal. And you know what? It takes love. And that love should be the driving force because you love God and you love your brothers and sisters enough to stand the gap for them when they're too ignorant or too lazy to do it themselves. Verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and cannot sin because he is born of God. In other words, what he's saying here, you're not going to be a habitual sinner when you have that Holy Spirit in you and, you, and you're repenting and you're doing the best you can. A Christian is not going to be a habitual sinner. Someone who is a habitual sinner is most likely a liar and a fraud because it just cannot happen. Verse 10, In this the children of God are manifest. They're made known. People know who they are. And the children of the devil. Notice here, the two are contrasted. You know, many people think that uh, they can play the middle of the road. They can be somewhere in between. No, you can't. Because there's a line being drawn in the sand and has been drawn for a while. And there's a separation coming even greater than, than has existed. Where one is either a child of God, one of his servants, or they're going to be a child of the devil. Someone who says they're uh, a middle of the road or, uh, well, just kind of, yeah, just kind of go this way and that way and whatever way. No, no, you don't because you're on the side of the devil. You're either on God's side or you're on Satan's side. There is no in between, even if you're a nice person. Because being a nice person doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut it. You know, I can't, I, I can think of, uh, the quote by, I, th I believe it was Edmund Burke, who said, uh, evil flourishes when good men do nothing, or good women as well. What does that mean? It's, if someone who says they're middle of the road and just stands by and watches, they are in essence allowing evil to flourish, which means they're kind of a partaker in that kind of a partaker in that. Think about that. This is, this is uh, very serious because what does that display? It displays that you really, that someone who just stands by and watches doesn't really love their brothers and sisters all that much. Because if you knew what was happening to them, how could you sit back 
and allow it to continue on without doing your best to try to do something about it. I guess the analogy we could use is a simple one. If you see someone walking off the cliff down to, the, down to an, a bottomless pit and, they don't, and that person doesn't see the pit, would you sit there and watch them? I could even add a little bit of description to this, what happens in many, many times. Would you sit there and entertain yourself on your lazy boy chair, watching a television program while someone is walking off the cliff to the bottomless pit? Because that's what many people do in this generation. They're too busy entertaining themselves while the world is falling apart. Um, well, let's go to verse 10. In this, the children of... We read this first half, but we'll, re, we'll uh, reread it. The children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. This is how you tell the difference is what he's saying. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Someone who doesn't do. Neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Again, what does love mean? Just telling it, to, you know, just being nice to people, being sweet. Obviously, that's part of it. But love goes much deeper than that. Love actually, um, true love is actually telling the truth to someone, even if they're going to hate you for it, even if they don't like it. That's true love. A soothsayer, of which we have way too many in this generation. A soothsayer will just tell you the things you want to hear. Oh, just believe, be saved, and get raptured. Oh, you don't have to worry about reading the book of Revelation. And on and on the list goes. Verse 12, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. You know, he was both physically and spiritually of the wicked one. And you can document that in, uh, well, many different places. John 8, verse 44 talks about it, but um, the parable of the tares in Matthew 13 describes to us just how evil, that evil seed was sown into this earth to corrupt it. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew... Why did he slay him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. In other words, he was jealous of them. And you know what? The Kenites are the same way today. They hate the true children of God. They hate those who stand up for righteousness because their hearts are wicked. Their hearts are wicked. In other words, John's saying, hey, we don't want to be like Cain. We don't want to be like the Kenites. Verse 13, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. What, what he's saying here, and um, what John is saying here, why, don't, don't be surprised when you're a Christian if most of the world doesn't appreciate you all that much, if they hate you, if they talk against you, if they slander you. Don't be surprised. You should have known this. You know, Think about Christ when he was here. They nailed him to a cross. And yet he was perfect. Why is that? Because the world hates the truth. And this world is under control, under the influence of the prince of the air, speaking of Satan. Verse 14, We know that we have passed from death unto life when we accepted Christ. Um, we resurrect with him because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. You know, again, he stresses over and over again. Someone who doesn't have compassion and love other people, they abide in death. That's, that's, what, that's what this is all about. Verse 15, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, 
And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Someone who hates somebody enough to want to take their life, that's pretty bad. You think we'd want anybody like that in the eternity? Well, I, I don't really think so. You know, God will be the judge. But, um, you know, John is taught, this letter is written to, the, to uh, his fellow Christians. And, um, you know, he's kind of tell, he's stressing over and over again that we're supposed to love the brethren. You know, all too often sometimes we see other Christians um, nitpicking and ridiculing other Christians for no good reason at all. Other than the fact sometimes it's over jealousy, sometimes it's envy, and things like that. And that's kind of what John is trying to say here. He's warning them, hey, love each other. Be good to one another. You are the sons of God. You are the children of God. You're royalty. So we're supposed to act like it. If Christians are tearing into each other, gossip, gossiping about one another, telling lies, what kind of an example does that set? You know, and that makes me think of this too. There are some people out there who think knowledge alone is going to get them into the kingdom of heaven or get them a special place. But you know what? Knowledge without works. Same thing as knowledge without faith is dead. Doesn't matter how much, I mean, knowledge is important. But when someone doesn't combine that with love, it's worthless. It's worthless. And that's kind of the point John is trying to nail home here. Verse 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That's how much love we should have for others. You know, and none of us are perfect. We try, we strive. But it should be a self-sacrificing, um, selfless, serving love towards others. And that's what he's saying. We should be willing to give our lives for the brethren, for the truth. And we know that there are some rough times coming um, known as the Great Tribulation. And many of us are going to go through some, some perilous times. Some trying times. There's going to be a lot of pressure put upon us. And we must always have that mentality that if we had to give our life for the truth, we would do it without hesitation. And that's true love. And I, I can't help but also think of soldiers here as well. Those people who have died, who have risked their lives or who have paid the ultimate price for us to have freedom, those people displayed true love. You know, we got way too many people back here in this nation today that, uh, I'm speaking of liberals, they have no, you know, they think they're so loving and so caring. I think a li most liberals today really don't have any idea what true love is. They really don't. It's all a bunch of words. Yakety yak for them. Because if you look at the liberal principles, their values, they're in stark contrast to the Word of God, which is based upon love. So I dare say that as someone who is a liberal would fall in the category of being in that group of those who do not love their brethren. You know why? Think of all those people who voted for this socialist uh, leader that we have today. Think of that. They're putting their brothers and sisters in bondage. That's not really showing love. That's not showing compassion. That's showing ignorance, self-service, and many other things, and rebellion against God and His commandments. And I'll, you know, I could just, that, that just really burns me up at this time. 
because of what we're seeing happening in our nation today. Would to God people had the knowledge of God's word and the love to do the things that he tells us to do. Verse, um, verse 17, But whoso has, hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his balls of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? In other words, hey, when you see somebody in trouble, you want to help them. And this verse here could be, could be uh, played on by con artists galore. We're not talking about, you know, many times you can discern a con artist a mile away trying to use a Christian's compassion for their advantage. You know, that, 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 that's disturbing when you see people do that. But what, what it's saying here is, hey, you know, Christians are supposed to have compassion when we truly see somebody in need and we have the ability to help them. It is our duty to do so. Verse 18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You know, someone who says they love someone um, doesn't necessarily mean that they do. They have to show it in deed and in truth. Verse 19, And hereby we know that we are of the truth, and we shall assure our hearts before him, for if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. What he's saying here is, hey, when you're doing what you can, when you're doing your best, you will have confidence before God, even in your prayers. And He'll answer them if they are the things that are right for us and right for His work. But, you know, if we approach God and we're like, oh, halfway, half-hearted, knowing, oh, yeah, I was kind of, you know, I didn't really live up to my capabilities. I didn't use the talents that were given me. I just kind of sloughed it off. And um, now I want this, Lord. Do you think He's going to answer someone like that? No way. Not a chance. Not a chance. But someone who has tried their best and comes before him and said, Lord, I need this. I need that. Help me here. Please, I want to do your work. He's going to help that person. I can speak from uh, a certain amount of experience in that. That God never lets someone down when they are trying to do his work. He answers prayers. And he's there leading, guiding, and directing. When we have the faith to know that he is there and he will perform the things uh, that, he, that he promises that he'll perform. In fact, it reminds me of one place where Christ said, If we have the faith as a small grain of mustard seed, we can remove mountains. We can defeat the enemy. We can stand up against the Antichrist and defeat his beast system. And we know that many will because they will be singing that victory song in Revelation chapter 15. Will you be one of them? Do you have the faith? Do you have the courage? Do you have the boldness to make a stand? Well, that's what, that's, that's what we're trying to help do here with this ministry. We're trying to help give people the knowledge, the wisdom, the skill, and try to motivate people for the battle coming. Because it's going to be intense. Satan's going to use every little thing that he can against each and every one of us. He's going to play on our weaknesses to try to get us to fall on our knees before him and we must understand that we must understand that and it and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son Jesus Christ and love one another and here he goes again and love one another in other words don't be a jerk to other people as he gave us commandment verse 24 
And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him. There's that word again, mino. They, they reside in God and with God, with his spirit. And he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the spirit which he hath given us. You know, that's how we know. I know many of you have felt that touch, that touch of the Holy Spirit that warms your heart. It's almost like, I guess an analogy you could use is a glass of wine. You know how you take that sip and it gives you that warm feeling. That's how the touch of the Holy Spirit is. It just makes you smile. It makes you happy. It makes you feel fulfilled. And it makes you full of that love that we're supposed to display to others because He gave it to us. In fact, again, you know, He gave us his only begotten son. Think about that. There can be no greater love than than he has displayed to us. And I and I and I think of uh, another place where Christ illustrated to us that a fleshly parent, a good earthly parent, will will give good gifts unto their children. They they will try to um, protect their children. Show their love to their children. And Christ mentioned there, how much, if our earthly parents will do that for us, how much more love do you think our Heavenly Father will display to us? Again, His love is displayed to us in many different ways. And in ways we, we don't even see sometimes. Sometimes He may cause us to go in a direction different than we want because it's for our own good because it protects us sometimes even tragedies could happen in our lives where we we think they're you know terrible and they may bring us to a better place you know there there are things our father's in control and he knows what's best for his children and you know i just what a fascinating chapter um the true love um, taught to us by the Apostle John from God's Word. How amazing it is. We thank you for joining us for this study. Um, we just want to also thank you for your love and support for your tithes and offerings. Help us reach out to others who are lost in the confusion of this world and, and to help pull them up so that they too can come into the truth and be a Christian overcomer. Let us close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Oh, we just thank you also for all the love that you've shown to us. Help us to see your love, those, those ways that you display your love to us in our daily lives so that we can appreciate you and show that love as best as we can in return. In Yeshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.